let us solve them and if you anyone has uh, for example if Ria, if you have any questions from matrices then then also we will discuss them. okay so let us see so problems from art in algebra I mean, Artin's book, Algebra, there is also something called Artin Algebras, which is a very special kind of algebra, but this is the Artin's book. And his father is Emil Artin, or maybe some related. Yeah, the, he, it, that algebra is named after him, but this book is, is after this person, Michael Artin. So uh, let us see which problem number this is. So this is chapter one and problem number 1.10. So one, 10. This is, uh, let me read the question if you don't have the book with you. So now we are first going to look at diagonal matrix, okay? And then you have another arbitrary matrix. And then we are going to compare the products DA and AD, okay? So D be a diagonal matrix. So here, when we say diagonal matrix, you see it is obviously going to be square, right? Otherwise, maybe diagonal. Otherwise, it still can be matrix, but we are assuming it's a square matrix, okay? And uh, with the diagonal entries, maybe I will say DII. Let's call them simply call them DI, and the other entries are obviously zero. That's what it means to be diagonal. And A is an arbitrary matrix. So A is an arbitrary matrix. So it is in MNR or whatever field. Okay. We want to compute and compare maybe uh, DA and AD. Want to see the extent to which they are different or such. So the question is just this. It's a little vague to be honest, but let us see. So first, the easiest question you can answer in yes or no, will these two be equal? Given that D is diagonal, so maybe before saying you can just do a quick check with a two by two matrix. Right, so can you give an example? A, zero, zero, so you're saying row-wise. Okay. okay. Oh yeah, you said B, sorry, sorry. So, okay. Okay. Right. So that I think there is a good enough answer, but then Nagesh, can you then tell what the product will be? Let's say AD. Based on that philosophy of linear combination of columns, or even directly if you compute. Right. That will be 5AA. six B and two B, right? So you see what has happened, right? We have basically taken this column and this column. So this is something which I had mentioned once, right? And uh, 
maybe you should check it, right? That you take this column and this column, so you treat them as vectors, right? And then you have this matrix multiplication AD. And then as Ria was saying that you, when you compute the first column of the output, that is a linear combination of the columns of A, where the coefficients are coming from the first column of D, right? Nagesh, is that statement clear? Because that's a, usually not how matrix multiplication is told in, uh, let's say 12th level, but. It, but you're, you're comfortable with the statement, right? Okay, then you should then try to prove it. Okay, but we will not do the proof. It's very simple. It is just bookkeeping. We have done similar proofs, but you can try the proof. That that interpretation of matrix multiplication is extremely useful. So obviously these two are not going to be the same. Okay. Then the question is, when are they the same? Okay. But then before doing that, let us just quickly write down the product properly. Okay. So, oh, I have a call. Just a second. Uh, who is this? Oh, how, yes, yes, yeah. Okay, okay, yeah. Okay, okay, but you are fine, right? Okay. Oh. Yeah, you didn't give the exam. Yeah, actually, I had to take that take that call. Yeah. Anyways, uh, so now have you people complete uh, computed this product? Right. So in general, can you tell me what is it coming out to be? Like DA. No, but no. In general, in general, also you have done. I think you can do it. Yeah, yeah. So, this uh, see is like is it very simple, right, Nagesh? Yeah, it's very simple. So now, now tell me, uh, this, when are these two products equal? That is fine, but uh, okay. So let me ask the question properly. Okay. Uh, if AD is, I, the question was not, uh, not asked correctly. If AD is equal to DA for all A in M and R, then what can you say about D? it will be scalar, right? That implies that D is scalar. So being scalar is sort of necessary, okay? So this is AD and also maybe, uh, so this is DA. Also AD will be, let us write it. I know it is simple, but let us write it, no harm. So if it is equal for all A, then why is D scalar? Ria, tell us, why will, why will D1 be equal to D2? Nagesh, is this, is this question clear? Because now we have sort of moved into a slightly different question.
okay so but why let us write it so you should say like okay let us compare this is how i will say that okay uh, if i look at the ij so i will do what you have said right if i take the ij then what is it it is um, dj aij right and then this should be equal to because it is given to us with the ij component of this and what will that be right right and now if these two are equal and this right but here here you have to just say that uh, we can assume aij is not equal to 0 because it is given to be true for all a you see nagesh that's a point that one has to mention right you have to you can assume that i mean it's all it's all very very simple things i'm saying but you understand that and so then you're done there is there is not not anything to do okay. and certainly the reverse is also true there is no question about that So, okay. Is symmetry along the diagonal. In what case? What does that mean? Oh, oh you are saying you are saying if A is symmetric. You're saying if A is symmetric, D is, D, D is symmetric, but so you know how, so D looks like this. And zero everywhere else. So D is symmetric. Huh? No, but zeros are mirroring. So what do you mean by mirroring? Oh, but then that won't be D. Is this, this is a D. So D, so D is diagonal, okay? D is diagonal already, right? Oh no, so the, then that's, that's an interesting question. I think I don't know the answer to that. So you're saying that if, a is assumed to be symmetric. Are you saying that if A is assumed to be symmetric, then also can we say something? Or are you saying something else? Yeah, so A is assumed to be symmetric, right? So now for all A in, so it is this condition, means that it has to be symmetric, okay? So if A is symmetric, means that if this has to be true for all sim i think that is not i think what you asked but let me say that i think what you asked is slightly something different but if a is assumed to be symmetric and if you want this to be true for all symmetric matrices still you will get that d has to be scalar is that okay with everyone right so we are just saying that I want AD to be equal to DA for all symmetric matrices A. D is assumed to be a diagonal right from the start. So we are not questioning that. That will be a different question if we go into that. Okay. But if AD is equal to DA for all symmetric matrices, still also you will get that D scalar. Right. Because it's trivial, right? Because you have, you will have this. And then you will just want a symmetric matrix matrix where AIJ is equal to zero, right? You want a symmetric matrix for which AI, AIJ is not equal to zero. And you obviously have such. So that's so that that's all not an interesting thing at all. Okay. In a sense that is not interesting, but it is in, in it can be many, but yeah. That's nothing, but
so then, yeah, no, but that question cannot also be interesting. That if if a is equal to this, does it imply that a d is equal to d a, where d is diagonal? No. Right. If you only assume symmetric, then does it imply that a d is equal to d a? No. You have to d has to be scalar because if this was true, then this would be true for all all symmetric matrices, right? And then for all symmetric matrices, this would be true. And then AD equal to DA will happen, you know, for all symmetric matrices A without any assumption on D, but that is false. We have proved that D has to be scalar, right? So that is also not, not interesting. It's easy to answer in that sense. What is interesting is the following. If you don't know it, then it is interesting. So far, is are there any questions? Because well, I'm going to change a few things on the board. Okay. Now there is this thing which you can prove is even if you don't assume D to be symmetric, Okay, just T is a matrix. Okay, just T belongs to M and R. So you don't assume anything. Okay, you don't assume anything on D and you want this to happen for all A. Even that will be fine, but let's keep it linguistically simple. Where it's where it is not needed to be complicated. If A D equal to D A for all A in M and R, then that actually implies converse is also true, but let's focus on the main matter that D is scalar. Hence it implies that D is diagonal. So even if you don't assume D to be diagonal, still if there is some matrix which commutes with every matrix of M and R, then that matrix is the simplest matrix that you can imagine. Basically, the usual, the obvious uh, guys, uh, the obvious matrices are the only ones. This is can be proved. This is interesting. You should do it for homework. As a take it as a problem. Okay. Is the question clear? And this is uh, in a way very important. So the point is this, you, you look at all, to try this as a problem, you can look at two by two or three by three if, yeah. So basically the off diagonal entries will be forced to be zero. If you want something to commute with everything, the off diagonal entries will be forced to be zero. And after that, you can apply this problem we have done. So this is your uh, M and R, okay? And what you are looking for is those collection of matrices which commute with everything, okay? And that collection of matrices is actually inside the collection of diagonal matrices. These are diagonal, okay? And these are scalars. And here right at the center is the identity, right in the middle identity matrix. Okay. This is the kind of the picture. Okay. Now there are many things, interesting things here, but we will not go into them. Hmm? Yeah, so let's move forward then. <sighs> so that homework is there. Yeah, now there is a, just an easy exercise, but we should do it. So these exercises are just going to help us to translate the rules of matrix multiplication 
into some basically we want to isolate some computations which we are going to do repeatedly we want to convert them into basically mini theorems okay and so here we are just going to say that uh, this is problem 11 but i want to do it we should do this product of upper triangular and these are very important facts also these are very important facts product of upper triangular uh, triangular matrices is again upper triangle yeah so upper triangular is something physically below the diagonal it will be zero okay? so aij where uh, i is bigger than j is zero so aij is zero or i bigger than j yeah. So, so yeah, let us see how we can explain this. You can also try to use block multiplication, it's not needed, but sort of if you want to use such things, you can use it. So this is again, you have to just, you know, just pick up the pen and write, write the rule of matrix multiplication. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So can you repeat? So you are saying like this. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're saying those are for which R is less than I, less than or equal to I. Why? Why? What happens if? Uh, value of j is bigger than value of i no i i is bigger than j right yeah right so yeah so you want to show that show that uh, i bigger than equal to j implies that a b i j is equal to zero so how will you do that In what way? Okay. Uh, okay, you're saying if you break R like you have said, 
So you are saying R will go from one up to I. And then you are saying this R will go from I plus one up to N. Something like this. Okay, then. Then what do you say? Why, why? Okay. So this is zero. Why is this zero? Yeah, no, but then let's let's see. Nagesh, why is the first term zero? Right. Let's say it goes from one to i. Yes. Then why is it zero? Why is that summation zero? See, these, if these kind of summations are zero, then they have to be always, means every term has to be zero in these kind of things, right? So just simply say why every term is zero. Because there is no cancellation going on. This is a fact which is true in general, square numbers, positive numbers. So why is this zero? You have to just explain why is this zero. That you should be able to do from all these simple conditions, right? So just think. So you can think neutrally, you can even, if you want, you can forget this. Okay, so R is less than I, less than or equal to I. Okay, so then why is this me? Yeah, so R is less than I implies AIR is equal to zero. It implies AIR BRJ is equal to zero. Fine. Now, what do you do when R is equal to I? Write it, then think. So why is that zero? R is equal to I case also we have to consider, right? So then this BIJ is zero, right? right? There is no question about this, isn't it? BIJ is zero, right? So R equal to I, that implies that B R J equal to B J J equal to zero. B I J. B I J is zero, right? So what is the what is there to think? There is nothing to think. You can just simply draw a picture also, right? You can just draw a picture. Right? You can just say, okay, here it is, here it is zero and so it goes like this and this one goes like this, right? There's some i th row and there's some j th column, right? So you see, you can see that these are zeros, these zeros, and these are zeros. And when these guys become non-zero, 
by the time uh, by the time i mean yeah you, you can okay no this is wrong <laughs> i has to be lower than j yeah so but, but probably that picture is like a personal picture You can convince yourself like this, but let's work it out. So uh, now what happens in this second case? The same story, right? The BRJs will become zero, right? Right, BRJs will become zero. Right. And that is it, right? There is nothing you have to just write it out. Try to see it from the picture also, it's quite clear. I will not say that you have to, you should create your own model of it. So there is no problem. You have to just, just remain calm and do it. No, no, no problem. They're very simple questions. Nagesh, is this okay? Yes, and the, the goal of this exercise is to make you comfortable with the notation because other than that, there is really nothing, right? If you are comfortable with the notations once, then it's nothing. So that is all. So you have to practice them to get comfortable with the notations. Okay. Maybe we can just uh, make this question more interesting. You can, I don't know if I can solve it with the current machine, current machinery that we have, but we will try. Okay. Uh, let's just write it on a new page. Uh, a is upper triangular. So I will denoting, uh, yeah, maybe it's not the correct thing. I'll, I'll look at the correct notation online, but yeah. Then uh, show A inverse. And let's assume that A is invertible. Okay, so A is invertible, invertible. Yeah, show that A inverse is also upper triangular. This is more interesting, right? This is something fun, maybe. Let's try it. Let's try it. I'll just be back in a minute. Okay. Is the question clear? If A is upper triangular, then show that A inverse is upper triangular.
Yes. So any ideas about this one? Yeah, let me also just Okay, eigenvalues. Eigenvalues. I Nagesh, we have, we have not done eigenvalues, but if you can do my eigenvalues, I won't mind it. We'll try to explain it. But the yeah. Right, right. Just, 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 just one second, one second. I just want to know the notation for upper triangular matrices. Notation, notation, notation. So nowadays, when you Google, uh, this strange kind of things come. It has been overtaken by companies and so on. So. I should know this, but I forgot notation. Anyways, the notation is not so important here. Ah, right, Ria, so tell us, what's your idea? Hello? Yeah. So why, why is the, yes. So why is the upper triangular matrix inverse? Okay, one second. So, cofactor. So, what is the definition of cofactor? No, no. If you say the definition like that, say the definition in a, like I'm getting confused. So, okay. So, oh, okay. So tell me this. So cofactor of A at I comma J, right? So what is the definition of this? Yeah. Okay, once okay, fine. So step one is delete the ith row. Yeah, delete the ith row and jth column. Okay, and uh, call the uh, resulting matrix a prime. Okay, so if you have to say like so that you know, so the first step you say, right. Then what you get at the first step, you should give it a name, right? Then you can talk about it in the second step. If you don't give it a name or if you don't, then, or if you don't even call it step, if you don't even call it step one, then you will be repeating the same sentence again. And then the definition becomes, seems like it's very complicated. So call the resulting matrix. Um, yeah, let's just call it a cap. Okay, a prime, right. And then what is step two? So, so you should just say determinant of a cap because kis ke saath multiply hoga, you have to say that right? so the determinant of a cap right nice okay good so um, yes this is the definition right nagesh is this definition do you know what this is cofactor yeah yeah this is a very useful thing okay so now uh, what is your statement 
Ria, you're saying that if i is bigger than j or something, then cofactor is zero. Okay, so then you're saying if i is less than j, then determinant of so for for this matrix for upper triangular matrix okay so then determinant of a cap is equal to a zero so what there should be a nice reason why is this true No, no, so, no that, that, is, that is a question. It's upper triangular, then it is true. And you are saying that because it's upper triangular, it is true. No, that is not a proof, right? That's not a proof. If you say if it's upper triangular, maybe it's trivial, but then we should explain, right? If it's upper triangular, then why is it true? So yeah, let us think about it. So here you're saying that if I is less than or equal to J, then it is like this. Determinant of the Again, there will be some very simple explanation. That is what you have to come up with. So if you take this matrix, this is upper triangular matrix. So here we have zeros. Now we take i less than i less than j. So i less than j means that you take some ith row. Let's say you take some this ith row, you delete that row. Oh no, 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 that's completely wrong as is being said here. Oh no, wait, is this, is this correct? Delete the ith row and jth column? Yeah, that is correct. Yeah, no, no, that is correct, you're right. I, I mean, well, I was thinking something different, which will give the same thing, but okay. So we basically choose the, we choose the ijth entry. So a i j. Yeah, so let us say it is somewhere here. No, so if this and uh, now I'm getting confused. So this is the ith row and the jth column would mean something here maybe, right? So we take this and then we delete that row and we delete this column. So in the resulting matrix, yeah, is that correct? So why will the resulting matrix determinant be zero? Right, you can see in two by two case, you actually get the zero matrix if you remove i less than j. Nagesh, right? In two by two case, so in general also, there should be a clean explanation. It's not happening by accident. So there has to be a simple explanation. I mean, some, uh, but that is hard to believe. Some, some row should become zero, but that is not going to happen. Is any row going to become zero? No.
So what is going to happen? Tell me. Yeah, I will just say it. Okay, you should, by now you should have taken a three by three example and you should see, then you would know. This kind of thing, uh, calculations may, maybe will not give you the answer because calculation of determinant No, cofactor is upper triangular. Uh -huh. Why? No, no, why? No, no, no. For all diagonals are zero. Oh. Hmm. Oh. Okay, no, cofactor is a determinant. You should say this A cap, right? That is, right? but I understand that is uh, right. Right. So what is the, what is, what do you want to say about A cap? Right, okay, okay. Okay, okay, right. So you are saying two things. You're saying that the diagonal, there is at least one zero on the diagonal and it is upper triangular. Simple, right? You're saying these two things. Nagesh, is that clear? That A cap is upper triangular, right? And at least one diagonal entry of A cap is zero. Is that clear? Yeah, try to see that. That is the crux. Huh? Yes, exactly. So can you say which, uh, which index diagonal is going to become zero? A I I? I'm not asking anyone, both of you. you can, anyone can answer, it's not a particular, right? A I I will become zero, am I correct? Is it, yeah? A I I is zero. I think, yeah. And this is happening because J is bigger than I, you can see that, right? If J is not bigger than I, then that is not going to happen. Okay. Yeah. So you can just, if you want to write, then you have to, yeah, you have to say that, okay. Uh, a, I, uh, a, I, I plus one, ah, wow. <laughs> AI I plus one is equal to AI I cap. Right? AI I cap is equal to AI I plus one. Or, no, AI plus one I. That's wrong. Yeah, AI plus one I. Right? I plus one at row. I at column. The column is not changing because the column that is changing comes later. Now you know. And so this, and this is zero by definition. So this is, and this kind of proofs you have to write sometimes. Some, some teachers, some professors, some places, they want this reasoning. They want this precise thing. So that is something which you should not avoid. I try to avoid it. And then I sometimes not able to say the precise answer. You would have seen that in my discussions also, but this, that's it. So now, now what do we need to, why is then, the, why is the determinant zero? So why is, so fine, we understand these things that uh, AII cap means that AII of A cap, right? Is equal to zero, AII of A cap is equal to zero for some I, okay, that's fine. So why does this imply that the determinant is zero? Why? That also we need to prove. 
right? But we will assume that for the time being, and we should try to prove it for homework. That I don't know that. I yeah. Why? Why do we know that? Why is that true? So that's right. That is so. That's the correct thing which we have to prove. That's what we have to prove. And I guess so. Your statement is that in an upper triangular matrix, the determinant is just the product of the diagonal entries. That's homework. You should try to prove that. That is not difficult. Okay. So again, in an upper triangular matrix, the determinant is the product of the diagonal entries. As simple as that. Yeah, so it's nothing complicated. So that's why if some diagonal entry is zero, then so you can understand the technique that is going on. So then that is fine, right? And so we are know we know that um, the yeah. So then yeah, so from what we have discussed, right? It implies that the adjugate adjugate of a is upper triangular. Right, and what is the adjugate of A? The adjugate of A is basically the matrix in which the entries. Uh, this is, I'm just, just very, very wrong. So this is, this J is here. Okay. The adjugate of A is what? In which the ijth entry is the, uh, yeah, I have to change that. So that notation was bad. That A cap notation was not good. Okay. I should say maybe a i j or maybe uh, cofactor c of a c i j of a right yeah so the cofactor is a j j i th cofactor cofactor at j comma i is placed at i comma j that is the adjugate matrix that's the definition all this looks very very artificial but it is not okay but maybe I don't have the time to say it now but uh, yeah. It is this, right? This is the matrix. This matrix has these entries. And now we have proved, right? That if, uh, yeah, just the right thing. So if I is bigger than J, then it is zero, mm -hmm. which means that here, if I is lesser than J, then it is zero. And so it means that it is upper triangular. Okay. So we know this, and then we know that uh, A inverse is nothing but more or less adjugate of A means that's the determinant of A. And uh, determinant of A is just a number. Adjugate of A is your upper triangular matrix. And uh, that multiplying an upper triangular matrix with a scalar is again an upper triangular matrix for sure. Right? So that is what it is. So A inverse is also upper triangular. Okay. So this discussion, uh, you know, this was uh, related to two points. But I think this fact is very important, which uh, you should know. A into adjugate of A is equal to determinant of A. It looks like a very strange formula, but it is actually very simple. But if you don't know, then you should just assume that it is true. For now, if you don't know the proof, no problem. And this is obviously multiplication. So Nagesh is this formula and the notations, everything, this makes sense. Sure. Yeah. So now maybe I'll uh, I will stop, but then the homework maybe is to again work out why this formula is true. Okay, it is true for some very nice reasons, very very nice reasons, uh, but maybe we'll not discuss them right now. Okay, very very nice simple reasons is true for, and let me just end by saying one more thing. Let me end by saying one more thing. There means some other ways to see why this is true. Okay, some other ways to see. So one one other way would uh, can be like the following, right? So if you just take take the identity matrix and um, yeah. Just take the identity matrix and take the matrix A. Okay. 
Uh, yeah, but uh, maybe I can, yeah, I don't need that. Just take the matrix A and just try to, you know, just try to imagine that uh, this matrix A stands for some system of equations. For example, if it is, you know, just the associated system of equations, right? A one, two, and two, two, and two, three. So you see that the system of equations you get from there. Or just to put it very short, you have A, and you just apply some row operations. You apply those row operations, right? Where you swap two rows or you, you, know, you take a row and you multiply it with something and you add it to another row, take a row and you scale it, right? So if you do those operations, right? You do row operations on A. That we know is just multiplying A on the left by some matrix, right? So every time you take a row operation on A, it is equivalent, the matrix that you get you can get that by just multiplying on on the left of A by those the corresponding elementary matrices. So what happens in the end is this is true for any matrix. Some finite step, you get the identity matrix, right? And basically this is your inverse. Okay. So if you can just show that this is upper triangular, this is just ideas, it's not a proof. You have to just show that this is upper triangular. Right, but you have proved that product of upper triangular is upper triangular, so it is enough to just show that each of them is upper triangular. Right, each of the these matrices are upper triangular. Yeah, you can manage with upper triangulars if A is given to be upper triangular. Okay, so well, if A is given to be upper triangular and you you uh, Yeah, right. So, right. So here, here you have to show that uh, each EI, each EI can be uh, upper triangle, right? can be taken to be upper triangle. Right. Which means that the row operations that you will do they will all have to be such that you don't involve lower matrices which are not upper triangle. So what uh, what do I mean? I mean that if you have this, this matrix and you want to swap the rows and you want to you know, go to this matrix. So for this, uh, what operation do you need? You will need to multiply this. <sighs> by this, this is not upper triangular, right? So you would want to avoid such matrices. What we would want to avoid such operations, right? So you don't want to swap, right? Imagine, imagine that you have a three by three matrix. Okay. If you want to row reduce this matrix, then are you going to need swapping of rows? Would you ever need to swap rows if it is invertible? If A is invertible, would you ever need to swap rows? No. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. We will come to that. We'll come to that. But certainly swapping of rows is not needed. Okay. But we should try to write a proof and see if it is that if it is if it is that easy. Yeah, something like that will be the reasoning. But this is again something which we have to yeah. I think that reasoning is sufficient. Swapping of rows is not needed. So what are the other operations? The other operation would be uh, taking a row and uh, adding it to a sort of, uh, you should do that for homework. You should do that for homework that in all those things, you will always have to, you will always have to take a row and sort of, you know, add it, multiply it, it's fine. Multiplying it with a scalar is fine. But when you're adding it, it's always enough to take a row and add it to some row which is higher and that will be enough, right? So at each stage, you will only need to add to some higher row. 
right? And if you add to some higher row, then the what are the matrices for that? Suppose you're taking the third row and adding it to the first row, then the matrix for that, which will do that, the matrix that you multiply by to get that effect is going to be this matrix and it's about right. Right? So you'll always need to do only those kind of operations. That's what you have to show. And that you can easily show. Same reason the diagonal is non-zero. So you can basically use the diagonals to make everything else zero. Basically, that's as simple as that. So yeah, it's quite obvious in that way. Yeah. So this is again a very easy, we don't know, you can avoid that adjugate reasoning. But for this, maybe the I would just need to discuss those uh, row operations properly once yeah, before getting into it, before expecting you to write this proof clearly. Okay, but you can revise it on read it on your own. I would I would say first for Martin, just have a look. It's easy. And the other thing is that basically the other thing is most interesting is that if you take any matrix A, right, and if you keep like you do powers of it, right, to powers. Then you can also think of it like this, that uh, maybe you can also take this matrix A to the power of zero, right? Now you can you can think of it like this. These matrices are also vectors. Every way, three by three matrix is like a vector in nine dimensional space, okay? R9, right? Two by two matrices is a vector in four dimensional space, correct? Is it not, right? As, as far as addition is concerned, right? as we don't multiply, Right, so basically these are vectors, right? These are vectors in, like if A is nine, three by three, then it's nine dimensional space, right? Mm -hmm. So if you have too many vectors in nine dimensional space, I mean, at one point they will become linearly dependent, true or not. Take two dimensional space, if you take three vectors, they will bound to become linearly dependent, right? If you take nine dimensional space and you take 10 vectors, then they're bound to become linearly dependent. Proof is not difficult, don't worry about it, but just the idea is to interpret matrices themselves as vectors, which is the key thing. So if you interpret that, then, then it means that it, if suppose these are in n dimensional, n, n by n, then you have to go to let's say n square. Now you have n square plus one vectors in n dimensional space, right? This cannot be independent. Right? These cannot be independent. And so the very simple fact, what does it mean to not be, it means that there's a linear combination which makes them zero, okay? So this and this and you see, like this and so on. Whatever, maybe I should start with a zero. That's better, okay? So this, and now these, these facts are, these are interesting facts, some interesting facts, right? Obviously, this also needs a proof. Why will this come in? But just give intuitively, I'm telling you. This is zero. And now what does this mean? Uh, what does this mean? From here, why, why? No, they are not linearly independent. Why are they linearly independent? They are linearly dependent, right? No, no, no. Oh, so if if you if you take if you take three vectors in two dimensional space, then they are linearly dependent, right? So so here I am taking n square plus one vectors in n in n square dimensional space. Matrix is like n square entries, right? So it's a vector in n square dimensions. Uh, oh. so, yeah, so this, they will form a, they will have a relation, a linear relation. Now from here, you can cook up an inverse, right? Because this, you can take this I that side and you can reason what happens if C naught is zero. But if C naught is not zero, then this is interesting. When you have this and if C naught is not zero, then you can just imagine it as one, you can divide by that. You have this and then you have So have we found an inverse for A? Yes, this is the inverse. 
any b that makes it identity right that is inverse one side it is fine the other side follows the a b is equal to identity means b a will be identity you can prove that means that's also an interesting thing but that actually you can do not you can see it here from here only but first you see you get an inverse right this b and obviously other way also right you can pull out the a from here and you can write it here right that's that is okay because a and a a, a and a commute it's okay that's it so b is the inverse and the inverse is actually a poly, sort of a polynomial in a and obviously now we have proved that product of upper triangular matrix is upper triangular so each of these powers are upper triangular when you add upper triangular they are also upper triangular so in fact the entire thing is upper triangular, right? So this is upper triangular. That's it. Modulo that fact that they become there is a relation. That's that's just we can reduce that question to system of equations without really, yeah. It's not as complicated because if you shouldn't think of it this fact as being special to matrices. No, these are just. Matrix is just an n squared tuple of numbers, and you prove it like in that generality, then it's actually proof is very clean. It's abstract, that's how it is meant to be, but it is clean. Okay, this proof is sort of the one of the better proofs in the way that, right? You don't really have to, we are not really too precise about what the inverse is. We are not really finding the inverse or anything because these CIs you don't know, but we're just doing. We are doing just the job that is required. That's why it's a nice proof. And this will work even in places where you the inverse doesn't have that nice adjugate dot dot property or that nice algorithmic property where you can find it via that process Gaussian elimination. Even in places where you cannot do those things, this will still be true. This will still work. Right, so the inverse is upper triangular. So product of upper triangular is upper triangular. Sum of upper triangular is upper triangular. Inverse of upper triangular is upper triangular if it exists. So basically the upper triangular matrices in by themselves are sort of have an addition and multiplication, right? So they are like a subfamily among all the matrices. Okay, right. So when you do group theory, you will see they form a normal subgroup of whole GL and R and so on. But anyways, that's, yeah. Okay, so I think we will stop here. And uh, yeah, this is it for today. Uh, I, I, I will see. Uh, can you people, is it, uh, I don't know, first time to ask this. Uh, I also plan to, no, 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 no leave that. This matrix we will do, uh, not, not like that. We'll do it next week, okay, yeah. So yes, let's uh, leave this uh, here for today. I am I will be taking this problem solving class, which uh, is sort of I will suggest Nagesh to definitely attend seven forty five. Okay, doing it in the morning. I don't know if if you will be available. You should let me know if there is any problem. Then I can try to make it in the evening. Otherwise, I'll keep it in the morning. Okay. This Thursday, uh, no, only this Thursday because of some exam stuff. So that's why. Yeah, here we will do problem solving. Okay, so if, then if there is any problem, then you can tell me. I will change it. But if there is no like legit problem, then we will do it at this time. Okay. Uh, yeah, and Ria, if you want, you can also attend. But this will just be problem solving for like ISI, CMI, BSc entrances. Okay. It's it's up that's up to you. Yeah. But for Nagesh, it's it's sort of mandatory. All right. So then this the matrix class, I suggest that Thursday is okay. So we'll just we can continue this every Thursday, uh, 9 p.m. Okay. I think this time is fine. We can fix this. I don't have anything at this time on Thursdays. Oh, sorry, Tuesdays. Tuesday, Tuesday, Tuesday it is. It's not Thursday. Tuesday. This usually I will try to make this thing. Friday 9 p.m. from next week. But this Friday 9 p.m. because that guy has a board exam on Saturday 12th. So I don't want to, uh, yeah, morning. So better to not have class in the Friday night. Okay, that's it. So you know all the timings. Yeah. All right, bye.